Welcome! In this tutorial I talk about the new Pro Render features in Maxon Cinema 4D Release 20. As a great example we will use this scene by the talented artist Yang Ge. Yang Ge is using Cinema 4D since his college time in 2004. He owns a production company and the only Chinese Maxon authorized training center. You find more information about him and his work on his website. Before we dive now into this tutorial I want to make a brief introduction of myself. My name is Helge Maus and I'm a Maxon certified lead instructor. I work now since 18 years in the industry as a 3D and VFX trainer for my company Pixel Train. You find more information about me and my trainings on pixeltrain.de. So, let's get started with our scene. So, we are back in the original scene by the artist and in the first step we want to analyze this scene really briefly. I go out of the camera here and if you look around here you see this is a typical studio setup which you use for product shots. Let's stop here the ProRunner for a moment. You see here our product in the middle of the scene on this wooden plate and around this you see different kind of light sources. Some of them are direct like this backlight here or the light sources which are placed here inside of these cylinders to direct them more to the product themselves. But you also find here these big planes here which are used as reflectors. In front of these planes there are placed light sources and these light sources here, I try to grab one, okay there it is, they are not directed in direction here of the product but they are directed here to these planes and only the reflected lights of these light sources illuminates here the middle part of the product. The last light source we have in this setup here is an HDRI which is placed on a sky object around this scene. So you see it's a really typical studio setup and this is the first step we want to go in this tutorial. So I switch over to our tutorial start scene. I use for this the V key on my keyboard to open the radial menu and because I've opened both files I can go here to projects tutorial pro render test. So this is the scene we want to work now with and you see here are some preset materials from the artist and also a part of his product and we want first to start with ProRender. Let's go into the render settings and to activate ProRender you can go here to the renderer and switch the engine to ProRender. ProRender itself is a ray tracer, an unbiased unidirectional ray tracer. What this means is that there are no caching principles going on. Everything is ray traced. And through this ray tracing process, which is really easy on one side, you have the big advantage that you don't get artifacts in any kind of way. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that the ray tracing process takes time. And so the big advantage of ProRender is that it calculates on the GPU. For this it uses OpenCL or Metal here on my Mac and so it's a little bit independent from the manufacturer of the hardware. Sure, if you have an AMD card it's more optimized because ProRender is made by AMD but in other cases it will also run. If you now think about a ray tracing process, normally you have to set up how many bounces or how many depth passes you want to have with your ray. That means if you want to have a reflection for example this is named bounce and you see here under the preview tab that we have three bounces in the moment inside of this preview. If you want to have more depth we will see some of the problems you have with these lower values here later you have to increase them and we will come back to this value later. I said that you don't get artifacts. The only artifact you ever get in an unbiased renderer is noise because it normally starts with a really coarse result. I can demonstrate this here. I go back to my viewport here and say I want to start my pro render now here from this view. And you see it takes a while and then it starts. And you see it starts really noisy and then more and more iterations are calculated and the result gets better and better. To get rid of the noise we need iterations and these settings we have here 
under iteration count and we will talk about these settings a little bit later. So everything is set up now and you see we don't have any light sources going on in the moment but we still see light. The reason for this is that ProRender gives you, you see it here under general, a default light if no light source is present in your scene. If you really want to make sure that you never get a default light, switch this off and this is my safety tick. So I do this in the moment and then everything is black here. I stop my pro render for now. The first step we want now to go is we need a sky object with an HDRI around this. So we go into the Cinema 4D sky here. A little side note here, Cinema 4D R20 is also now able to work with a physical sky. It bakes in the background the texture of the physical sky as an HDRI and so we can use many features of the physical sky. Not all, but many of them. We go to the standard sky here, which is only an infinite sphere around our scene and then we have to add a material with the HDRI. So I go here to create, select a new PBR material and we name it sky and we can place it directly here on the sky and then we dive into the material and we can deactivate the reflectance for a moment, go to luminance and now we load here our HDRI which I want to use. This one here. And now you see that the HDRI is now placed around the scene here and can be used. If you want to have more resolution here, you can go here to the editor settings inside of the material and you can change here the texture preview size if you like, for example, to something like 512 pixel so that you see a little bit how this room is lit. And if you now activate the Pro Renderer, Pro Renderer sees this sky with the luminance material now as a light source and now you see your first lighting. If you come from other render engines, you maybe think now about what about global illumination? Have you activated global illumination in the moment? For this, we go back here into the render settings under preview and you will see that the render mode in ProRender is always set here to global illumination. You can deactivate this and say I only want to have the direct illumination without any shadows or you also can go here and say I only want to have an ambient occlusion solution. But per default we have global illumination going on, it's a brute force approach and that's the reason why we have a ray depth over one here. So we have some bounces here and if you open this up you see you have three bounces diffuse depth which means three bounces of light for diffuse and this is the global illumination. Okay. If you now want to place the sky a little bit different, you can select this and take your rotation tool and you can rotate this around. And the nice thing in working here with ProRenderer is that you have an instant feedback in your viewport so you can directly see what's going on. If you want to get rid of the image in the background, you can add here a Cinema 4D tag, compositing, and I drag it here to the right and then you can deactivate scene by camera so only the light is calculated in all the rays but not for the camera. Later we'll see that this guy is also useful for reflections on our glass material so that's a good start. The next thing we want now to place are light sources and because of the nature of ProRender as a physical accurate renderer you can't use all the Cinema 4D lights here. For ProRunner, we use here the PBR light. If you add one here, it comes as an area light and I deactivate the sky for a moment so that you only see the result here of this light source. And like in Cinema 4D, you have now light settings. And if you take a closer look here to this PBR light, you see it's a Cinema 4D light, but many options are grayed out and some of the presets are made here automatically, which you normally do if you want to make a physical accurate rendering. 
For example, you have here an area light. So that's the first decision the PBR light has done. Shadow is always on because every light casts shadow. Under details, you will see that the fall off, which is inverse square physical accurate, is always on. So it's always correct. And here you can change how the shape is looking. Other things are deactivated because they are not physical accurate. If you want to work now with this light, you have to be aware that this light source has also a physical appearance. That means if you look straight to the light source, you have this illuminated plane here, which you can deactivate here under details with show and render, but it's still a light source here. And if you look to the back of a light, you see this black plane here because the light is only Z direction only. That means it only illuminates in Z direction. You can change that. But in some cases, you want to remove this black plane here because you want to place your camera behind this. So you also can go here to show and render and deactivate this. But in my case, I leave it on because it's an interesting approach here. If you now want to make a physical light from this, you can now go to general and say, okay, I want to change the intensity here. You can overdrive the values because you have a fall off. So sometimes you need really strong values here for your light source. And what you also can do is you change your color. You can change the color here by a color chooser, or you can switch here to the temperature. You can do it here in the color chooser. If you go here to Kelvin, or you can open here on the left side beside the color here, this little triangle, tick here, use temperature. And now you have here a temperature slider where you can make your light a little bit warmer or less warmer. And this is the way many architects or product designers work because they want to have an exact value for the color temperature. So these are the light sources or the direct light sources you have in ProRender. But there are some other light sources inside of ProRender. For this, I deactivate this light here and I add a so named mesh light. A mesh light is, for example, a plane. And I stop the ProRender for a moment. I place my plane here and I make sure that my plane looks into Z direction. Okay. And if I now go here and add a PBR material onto this plane, and I name it Mesh Light, I can now go into the material. I start Pro Render again. Nothing happens because the material in the moment has only reflectance. I deactivate the reflectance. And then I go into the luminance channel. And in the moment I tick this, you now see light in the scene. So this is a mesh light. The big advantage of a mesh light like this here is that you can use, for example, textures inside of that. For example, you have an HDR, which you want to use, for example, of a studio light. Or you can add a feature like this also in Cinema 4D. You can go here to this little triangle and add, for example, a gradient. And I make this preview also huge and to a plane. And if you go into the gradient now, you see our new Cinema 4D R20 gradient widget. And this widget is really, really useful if you work with lights like that. So I open here this little triangle. And here you can now select your color pickers like before. You can add them, you can drag them out. So nothing fancy about this. But what I want to do is I want to have a circular light. So first I go here to the type of the gradient and I switch here to circular. And now the circle is in the wrong direction. So you can make a right mouse button click here over the gradient and say, I want to invert the gradient. Then I bring this here a little bit in so that we have a full circle. And now you see this circle here is still lighting our scene, but yeah, the values are not high enough. 
And in older versions of Cinema 4D, we had the problem that we can't make this white here whiter than white. You see, this here is a complete white. But in this new version of Cinema 4D R20, we can now select this white here and go here to the brightness value, which is 100%. And now we can increase this brightness, for example, to 150%. That means the color is still white, so it hasn't changed here, but it illuminates like an HDRI. It is now 150% in luminance. And we can overdrive this to, for example, 500%. And now you see you have a really nice mesh light and you also can start changing here the falloffs with this falloff interpolations here, which we have now in R20 for every of these points and so on. So sometimes this is also a useful way of lighting a scene. And if you want to have some turbulence, you see exactly what happens here. So these are two ways of lighting. The third way of lighting is the way which the artist in this rendering has used. He wants to use a plane, but he wants to use the plane as a reflector like in the photo studio. For this, we take our area light, which we had before here, and place it under the plane. In the next step, I zero out the coordinates so that I'm exactly at the same position here like the plane. Then I move it a little bit out and rotate it 180 degree. So now my light source is pointing into the direction of this plane here. And this plane reflects through the ProRender global illumination its light into the scene. Get rid of the old material and start ProRender. And you see it works. The question arises now, what's the advantage about this? Hmm, the advantage is that we now can configure how this reflection plane looks. And if you take a look here into my materials, which I've copied, there's a lights tab and you have here a yellow and a blue light background. And if I place now on the plane this yellow one, you see this really, really nice gradient going on on the plane and you get a really nice lit scene here. If you need more light, you can go onto the light source and increase here the light if you like. And you get more reflections in your scene. If you change mind and you want to have a cooler light, you take the blue material and place it here over the plane and you get a blue reflector in your scene. Now you have seen the different kind of light sources we can use inside of ProRender. And I've prepared here this scene a little bit for you. You have your light setup going on. So I make it visible. We can remove our sky. I also prepared that. And if you now look into this, here's the sky. I place my sky material onto this. The sky is a little bit rotated here. That's the reason why I prepared this. And so I also want to have my compositing tag back where I deactivate scene by camera. And then we have here a backlight going on behind the scene. That's this here. Then we have here the shade on the right side, the shade on the left side, and we have a specialty here which the artists have given us. We have here this little cylinder going on. And this cylinder has deactivated caps. You see, if you go here, you see the cylinder has no caps. And what you can do now for yourself is you place here a light source inside, a PBR light, inside of this top light. Zero out here the coordinates and also here the angles. Then we change this here to a disk and we can make it small now and place it inside here of 
this cylinder. Now we have a light source which comes directly over our dessert here. And to make this object here invisible, because our camera will normally see this here, we can give this top light also here a compositing tag where seen by camera is deactivated. And yeah, that's it. If we now start Pro Render again, you now see that our scene is lit. After we've done now our lighting setup, we can talk about materials. And as ProRender likes physical values, we also use inside of ProRender only physical based materials. For this, we go here to the Create menu of the Materials Manager and we select New Physical Based Rendering Material. I add one of these materials here to this wood surface here so that we can see what's going on. And instantly we get feedback. Nice thing in ProRender. If we now go into this PBR material, you will see that the diffusion is gone and the environment, fog, and also the glow because they are not physical. You still can use color, which normally simulates diffuse reflections on surfaces. But the normal rule is that we want to have all the reflectance going on on the surface built here in the reflectance channel. And this is the preset which the new PBR material also does. If you go now here to the reflectance, you see that we have two layers. To make it more easier, switch here to the tab layers. You see here is a default diffuse layer and a default reflection layer, both working at the same time. That means we have a diffuse reflection going on and over that is a layer of normal reflections, which we say this is specular or reflections. To make it more easy, I deactivate or I delete this default reflection for a moment and we select now the only layer which we have, which is the diffuse layer. If we now go to the diffuse layer, you see the type of the layer is Lambertian. This is a diffuse shader and there's also another one which is named Orin Naya. So you can select which kind of diffuse reflection you want to have, depending on your project. Underneath that here is the layer color and this is exactly the place where you normally change the color appearance of your object. If you have an earlier versions changed here the color channel so this here is now in exchange your color settings. So you can go here to the color and say I want to have something brownish here for example and you directly see this is a diffuse reflection of the surface or you can tell the system, okay, I don't want to use color at all. I go back here to white. Instead of that, I want to use a texture and we load now a texture and we have here wood texture in the files. And if you now load this here, you see now the wood texture on the surface. But what you also see is that the projection here doesn't look quite right. Let's go out of this and change the projection for a moment. For this, I select here the surface and also here my texture tag and you see in the moment the UV map is used. So we don't have a clear UV map here on the surface. So you can go in here and say I want for example to use a cubic projection and you see it looks much better. If you want to change now the projections, we have some new features inside of Cinema 4D R20. We have now a nice projection display. And if you go here to the texture mode, you will see that we now have, I leave the camera for a moment and stop the bro render. You have here this helper widget going on, which is really nice. The old Axie mode is gone. You see, you don't have it anymore. So it's really easy. You can now move this box here because we have selected cubic here around. You also can use your scale tool to scale this and place your texture like you want. Also, you can rotate this if you say, okay, the wood looks better if I look in this direction. Or if the texture isn't such nice pattern so that you can really see what's going on, you also can select this here now. And we have a projection display here where you can see, I want to see a grid or a solid going on. So 
This is a really great helper if you want to place something here. If we have now the right projection found, for example, I say I want to have it flat. You see flat isn't right. We can rotate it 90 degrees. And now if you want, you can make a right mouse button click here on the texture tag and say fit to object so that we have it exactly fitted here on this part of the surface. The reason why it's here only on one side is that we have a symmetry object going on here over the wooden surface, so it starts again. And then we can leave here our texture mode again, and you see that's now the result we get. If we now go back here to our PBR material and start Pro Render again, you see that something is missing. In the moment, we only get the diffuse reflection here of this wooden surface. But what is missing are all the other reflections, like for example speculars or real reflections. And for this we need a second layer. You can stack here many layers of reflectance in this reflectance channel. If you need another layer, you go here to the Add menu and decide what kind of reflection you need. We talked about the diffuse reflection, and in our case, we really want to have speculars and real reflection. And for this, I normally use Backmon or GGX. I take the GGX model here. And if you like, you can name it so that you later understand which setup you have done. And if you add a layer here, you get a new tab. And if you select the tab, you only see the values for this GGX layer. GGX helps you to work with real reflections on a surface and the big advantage with GGX is if you increase the roughness really really strong you see that GGX has this wonderful fall off here and first you decide how rough the reflection has to be but now the reflection is everywhere and everywhere with the same amount and this is not correct. Normally reflectance is dependent on your angle of view and for this we need the Fresnel here. You can go to the Fresnel of this layer and it's working like a mask but this mask is made by the direction of the ray of sight. So you can decide which kind of reflection you need. Is it a dielectric or conductor? Conductors are metals and all other materials are dielectrics. So wood is a dielectric. And if you now select here dielectrics, you see that an IOR of 1.35 is used, which I like here. You see it looks better. And you see the more flat you look onto the surface, the more reflection you get. And if you look perpendicular to the surface, you see less reflections. This fall off is now correct. And the last thing we want to do is we want to decide how much reflection we want to have all in all. And for this, we can go here to the layers and change here this slider here and say we only want to have, for example, 30%. Or you can go into the reflection layer GGX directly. And here under mask, you have exactly the same amount slider here. But the big advantage here in this area is that we also can use a texture for that. So if it's not the same all over the surface. Now our wood is done. The next thing is normally we need a bump map for this. Let's add a bump here. We go back here into our textures and I load my wood texture again. And now you see that ProRenderer now uses the luminances of this here also for the bumps we can change it here a little bit for example like that and so now we also have bumps here on the surface if you like the next material we need is glass and if you want to do that we do the same again we go here to the pbr materials and place this pbr material here on this cup and to search this, we can press the S key. You see, here it is. And then we can go here back into the system and think about how glass is working. 
Normally, glass has no diffuse reflection. So we go here to the layers and remove this time this diffuse layer. And in the next step, we have to go here to the transparency and activate this. Now we have transparency going on and a little bit of reflectance. And we also can deactivate this for a moment so that we only see the transparency going on. And you see that you normally doesn't see the glass anymore. The reason for this is that we need a refraction value here. We can use 1.53, for example, for a glass material. And the moment you do that, you see you get not only the refraction, but also reflection. The reason for this is that transparency always delivers a reflection. You see this in the reflectance channel. Here it's added automatically and you don't have to activate these values here if you don't want to change this. Normally it fits perfectly because of this IOR. Okay, so everything is done here, but our glass looks a little bit hmm, strange. It's really black here. What's going on? You remember that I said that we have a ray tracer and we have to decide how deep this ray is calculating? We have here a refractive surface. That means it hits here on the front of the, for example, glass ball, and it has to leave on the other side. So you have two bounces going on. But this glass here is really nice model by the artist. So you have an outside, an inside, and on the other side, another inside, and then the outside. Here, the ray is not calculated completely through the glass. And this is something you have to change in your Pro Render settings. So if you go here to Pro Render, we are still in the preview values. You see that our maximum ray depth is still three bounces, so it's not enough. We need four bounces here to go through the glass. But instead of changing these values here, I open here this triangle, and this is a new feature inside of Cinema 4D R20 that we have now a branched approach. Instead of increasing only this value here to a ridiculous high value, we now can go in here and decide which kind of process gets how many bounces. You see, I've increased now the maximum ray depth to 14, but nothing has changed here because we limit, for example, the diffuse depth to 3, the glossy depth to 3, and our refractive depth here to 3. And that's not enough. If we increase this now to 4, suddenly our glass gets transparent. Later, we have maybe some areas in our image where we have a deeper refractive value because we have two glasses behind each other or something like that. So we can also increase this to a higher value, for example. Let's play safe with eight, for example, two glasses behind each other. And you have to check this later. Don't forget that these values are only for the preview renderer. For the offline renderer, you also have to set them. Otherwise, this here is the final image and you don't get the values here. So you see here in the offline renderer, we have a maximum ray depth of 12 and the refractive depth of 12. So that's good, but you have to check this, please. Now we have done two materials. The third one here is the gold. So another PBR. Place it here on the spoon. And if you want to make gold, you have to think about, okay, how does gold or metal work? You will see that the diffuse value of gold is extremely low. Normally, most of the things which are going on on the surface is reflection. So we go to the reflection here. I take Backman. I go to the Fresnel. And due to the cool programmers of Maxon, we have here a nice preset. We go under Fresnel to Conductor because this is a metal. And then we have here a preset for gold. I think here it is. And now you have your gold going on. You see it's really rough here so we can change this a little bit here and change now the appearance of our gold and now you see that this gray is really yeah strange and that's the reason why i normally go in here and remove all the diffuse inside of metals because the diffuse reflection inside of metals is really really low so remove it or make them black and now you see this here looks really like gold. 
this is okay and you see how fast this system now works so we have set up our materials now i will take now a little bit of time and add the original materials back to the scene and then we want to look into this chocolate here in the next step i'm back the last thing we want to do now inside of our tutorial scene is now we want to talk about the chocolate and the cream inside of the glass first let's make this glass here and visible so that we see it a little bit better we make this for the viewport and also for the rendering and to see the chocolate I overwrite now these red dots with green dots here and so we have now here our chocolate now we can start our program again if we want to do things like chocolate milk butter and so on we need an effect which is named subsurface scattering because light ray can penetrate into a volume like this and it bounces around inside of this volume so a part of the rays are blocked and a part of the rays will penetrate the volume and come out at other points so you can't make the chocolate only brown like i've said for this we need subsurface scattering and a new feature inside of cinema 4d r20 pro renderer is now that we have a ray trace subsurface scattering effect Subsurface scattering itself is not new for Cinema 4D, and I have to show you a little gotcha. I switch back here to the standard render for a moment, and I add here a Cinema 4D or PBR material, it doesn't matter. And the normal place where subsurface scattering lives is in the luminance channel. So we can activate this, we go here to the texture effects, and here's the subsurface scattering shader. And if you dive into this, it looks like that. This is exactly the subsurface scattering shader which we had in the version before. But if you now switch over to ProRender, you will see now a new subsurface scattering shader. So keep this in mind, these two subsurface scattering shaders are different. There is a difference between the standard and physical and the ProRender version. The reason for this is that the ProRender version is fully ray traced and this is also a little bit easier to understand so for this i've made here this chocolate here and if you now want to work with subsurface scattering normally you don't need any diffuse reflection so i deleted this layer here the only thing we need here is reflection ggx i have a little roughness on to this and also under fresnel i used an ior here of 2.4 so yeah this is made by uh, experiment it's not accurate for chocolate but it looks good now we go here to the luminance channel and like i said we added here the subsurface scattering shader inside of this shader now we have really few parameters and they are really easy to understand the first parameter we have here is the scatter color and because you don't have any diffuse reflection in the moment this is also the surface color. This is the color you see directly on the surface. Then we have a depth color, and this is the color inside of the volume. And the depth, how deep a ray can penetrate into this volume, is the scatter depth. And so it's dependent on your physical size here of the object, so you have to play with this. Sometimes these values are the same, so you can drag this value here by dragging the color over and then you change it in most cases a little bit here it's a little bit brighter so that's it here then you have the face the face means in which direction the scatter effect takes place you can read about this in the help file of cinema 4d or you can test it and if you have something for example like the cream here you sometimes want to overdo the reflection a little bit and for this we have an emissive amount if you have emission here it's really like a light source you get more energy out of that so keep this in mind that this here is also lighting your scene but for this cream here it looks good back to the chocolate now we have added here the subsurface scattering shader and now we can use it here on our chocolate and if we start now pro render you really can see now how the light rays will penetrate into the volume and you see here where the surface is thin 
you see the light rays going through and we get this light brown color and where the volume is thicker it blocks and you get this really nice chocolate effect. The same for the cream. The cream is placed here. We can also override this here and show it. Okay. And both are subsurface gathering effects and the artist has made really nice use of the subsurface scattering shader also here with the raspberries if you want to see them here on top of the chocolate you can activate them here we are finished now with this scene so i bring everything back to render and we have now to check our render settings and you will see in our preview that the cream which was white before is now really really black what's going on you remember when we started we had this ray depth subsurface scattering here is also something which has to do with volume and refractive depth and here you have to increase now this value also i go here to for example 12 and now you see the light rays are now able to come into this volume and go through don't forget that if you change values here you have to change them also here later for the final image in the offline otherwise you get a different result and we want to have a little bit of depth of field here also in the preview here for the offline i have activated it here so tick depth of field here and to place now the focal point go to your shot camera here is the focal distance under the object tab you can click here for example to this part of the glass here so Synfro-D measures now the distance to this point here and to change the aperture you can change here under physical the f-stop and the rule is the lower the f-stop the more the blur effect appears that's exactly going on here that's it for this tutorial i hope it helped you to start with this great new incarnation of pro render inside of cinema 4d r20 my name is helge maus from pixel train have fun